We're going to start our message today a little bit differently. If you turn to Psalm chapter 71 in your Bibles, Psalm chapter 71, this is not the text that I'll be preaching from, but this passage lays the foundation for what we're going to be discussing today. In Psalm chapter 71, we'll be reading just a few verses, verses 14 through 18. In Psalm chapter 71, starting verse 14, it says, But I will hope continually, and yet will praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the members thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation, and thy power to every one that is to come. Mm. Now this specific psalm was written by David. And most theologians believe that he penned this psalm in his old age, specifically at the time of his son Absalom's rebellion. There are some um, passages later on in the chapter and earlier that seem to bear that out. But really what we see in the few verses that we just read are what we would refer to as a testimony. And in the verses leading up to verse 14, we, what we read is we find David, like us, dealing with very much difficult times, fearful times. Uh, if you look at verse 2, we see in this verse, we see four specific petitions that David makes of the Lord that shows the fear and the stress that he was suffering, uh, in this case, at the hands of his enemies. In verse 2, he says, Deliver me, cause me to escape, incline thine ear, or hear me, and, all, and, and finally, save me. In verse 4, once again, he says, Deliver me. At the end of verse 11, he says, Make haste for my help. And then in verse 14, everything changes. David's entire tone and his focus changes in the text that we just read. One commentary I read put it this way. It says, David is here in a holy transport of joy and praise, arising from his faith and hope in God. Where there's a sudden and remarkable change of his voice. His fears are all silenced, his hopes raised, and his prayers are turned into thanksgivings. And if you'll look at this testimony with me, David makes some very amazing statements. In verse 14, he begins this testimony by saying, I will hope continually, and I will praise thee more and more. In the midst of his trials, in the middle of his enemies, in his in, in running and hiding from his son, who had rebelled against him, David says, I still have faith in God. And I will not only continue to praise him, in fact, I'm going to praise him more than I ever have. And verse 15 says, My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. Here's David saying, as long as I live, I'm going to share what you've done for me. I will tell other people about the power of your salvation my entire life. Verse 16, I will go in the strength of God. Everything that I do, I'm going to do for you, with you, and by your power. And then verses 17 and 18, O oh God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation, and thy power to everyone that is to come. Here we find David saying, you've been with me. You've guided me. You've directed me ever since I was a child. And even now, as I'm, an adult, as I'm older, as I'm an adult, you're still with me. I declared your wondrous works when I was a child, when I was a youth, and I'm still declaring your glory into my old age to this next generation. And this, in a nutshell is really what we've been studying the past couple of weeks. Raising children who continue to learn from God, continue to listen to God, continue to live for God, and love God when they become adults. And as we continue that thought today, I want you to think about the, the testimony that we just read here in these few verses that David gives. And think about your own testimony. How are you currently living your life, spiritually speaking? <clears throat> And you might be thinking, okay, but why? Because your testimony has an impact on others, especially those that are closest to you. 
Romans chapter 14, verse 7 says, None of us liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. And what that means is that how you live your life has a direct impact spiritually on the people that are in your life. Your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your co-workers. You can't just decide and say, well, I'm not going to have a testimony. Because the truth is, we all have a testimony. And the way that we live our lives is either going to draw the people that we love closer to God, or it's going to drive them and push them farther away from Him. And I've entitled today's message, Is Your Testimony a Stepping Stone or a Stumbling Block? And what we'll find today is that God gives very severe warnings to those who live their lives in such a way that it pushes or keeps other people from drawing closer to Him. And we'll also see some things that we can do to help draw the people that we love closer to the Lord. And with those thoughts in mind, if you would find Matthew chapter 18 in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 18, and once you've found the text, once you've found Matthew chapter 18, if you would stand please out of honor for the reading of God's Word. We'll be reading the first six verses today. And starting in verse 1, our text says, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for saving us. And Lord, we thank you for uh, yeah. the people in our lives that you bless us with. Our family members, our children, our grandchildren, our, our friends, yes. our co-workers, Lord, yeah. they are... A blessing, Lord, to have people that we love to do life alongside with us. And we thank you for them. Yes. Lord, as we look to your text today, I pray that you'll help us to become more aware of our own personal testimony. And of whether we are helping draw other people closer to you, or if there's something in our lives that is keeping us, or, or that is keeping other people from trusting you more fully or seeking you more closely. Father, I pray that you'll help us to become better disciples, better followers of you today from our time spent in your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can take your seats. In verse 6, we see a warning given to anyone who offends people that are trying to follow Jesus Christ. The specific example that Jesus gives here is offending little children. And someone who offends others is referred to as a stumbling block. Yes. Which brings me to the first point. Another word for offend is to repel. Repel is to do something in your life or to live your life in such a way that it actually turns people away from the Lord. Now some people, even some Christians, can be stumbling blocks to other people drawing closer to the Lord. They're obstacles or a deterrent to other people getting closer to God. And we're going to consider just a, a few ways that our testimony can be a stumbling block in just a moment. But first, if you would, notice the gravity of this situation. If you'll follow along in verse 6, Jesus says that anybody who's a stumbling block, anybody who offends, anybody who hurts, anybody who is an obstacle to other people growing in the Lord, or growing spiritually and trying to follow God, it says that it's better for them to have a millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned. Now a millstone was a stone that was used for grinding grain. And the average weight of a millstone is 1,629 pounds. That's over a three-quarter ton. Just to get an idea, an average Holstein cow, the black and white spotted cows, weigh about 1,500 pounds. Saltwater crocodiles weigh on average around 800 pounds. So when God's talking here about a millstone, he's not referring to a small pebble in your driveway. He's not talking about some rock you might just find as you're walking around the, the block. When God talks about a millstone, he says if you're, if you're going to offend someone, if you repel someone from, from drawing closer to him, you're better off having a stone that weighs three-quarter ton wrapped around your neck and be thrown into the sea. And you might be thinking, well, 
that can't be right. You know, maybe Matthew's just sensationalizing this a little bit. But then in Mark chapter 9, verse 42, Jesus says, Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it's better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea. Luke 17, 2, It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. If God repeats himself that many times in the Gospels, I think it's safe to say we should be serious about not turning other people away from the Lord. And we would be wise to take precaution to make sure that our own lives and our own testimonies are not a stumbling block to other people. You might be thinking to yourself or asking, well, what are some things that could make me a stumbling block to other people that are drawing closer to the Lord? Well, James 4.17 says, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. If there are things that you know that you should be doing as a Christian, and you're not doing them, it's a sin, and it's a stumbling block to other people that are trying to follow the Lord. And we already said this, but... The thing is, you don't get to choose whether or not you're going to be a testimony. You can't just say, well, I don't feel like being a testimony today, so everybody just kind of look away and nobody pay attention to me. Your friends, your family, your co-workers, they see how you act. They see how you live. And if you claim to be saved but don't live like it, that's sin. And that's a stumbling block from helping other people draw closer to God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, it refers to having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. That's like people who say they're saved, but don't live like it. People who claim to love the Lord, but don't live for the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, You're not your own, you've been bought with a price. But there are people who claim to be saved, who still want to live however they want to live. People who claim to be holy, but other people who look at them and label them as a hypocrite. People who claim to be saved, but their lack of a spiritual walk or relationship with the Lord is actually a stumbling block to the people that are around them. Now, how sad would it be to stand before the Lord one day and to walk into heaven only to realize before you took your first step into eternity that you were going in alone? Because your entire life spent here on earth was wasted. You might have gotten saved, but you didn't lead anybody else to the Lord. You might have gone to church, but you never brought anybody else with you. You may have even, by your own testimony, been a stumbling block to other people actually accepting the Lord themselves. The way you live your life will either draw people closer to God, or it will push them farther away from Him. Your testimony will either be a stepping stone or a stumbling block. And we see here in verse 6, a very serious warning given to all those who are stumbling blocks, or people who will repel people from following the Lord. Next, I'd like to look at our passage for he's on how to be a stepping stone. The steps that we can take in order to draw other people closer to the Lord. And the first part we'd look, I'd like to look at is reform. In verse 3 it says, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted. If you'd say that with me, except ye be converted. And become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Very simply, if we want our lives to be a testimony that can be used as a stepping stone to draw other people closer to the Lord, there must be evidence of personal conversion in our own lives. There must be a noticeable and tangible evidence that we have been changed and that there is something different about us than the unsaved people around us. If the people that you work with each day, if they can't tell a difference in the way that you live your life, in the way that other unsaved people live your lives, then, then you're not going to be much of a testimony for the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you are truly and genuinely saved, there will be a true and genuine conversion that takes place. Right. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. God says, when you get saved, I will convert your heart. I'll change your spirit. I will change your ways. If you claim to get saved, but you still live the same way you did before you got saved, I got news for you, you didn't get saved. I don't care if you grew up in, in this church just like I did. I don't care if you got baptized in this exact baptistry behind me. If there's no evidence or change or reform in your life, you didn't get saved, you just got wet. Yes. Amen. I'm not going to stay on this topic too long, but I believe many churches and many preachers are doing a grave disservice 
by using the back term, by, by using the term backslidden so freely. Look, God says you're either saved or unsaved. There's no in between. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. You're either for me or you're against me. You either love me and keep my commandments or you don't love me and you don't keep my commandments. Right. These people who say, well, I must be doing okay because God's not punishing me or anything. He must be pleased with me. No, you, must, you might not actually be saved is the issue. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 12 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 6, For whom the Lord, whom, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And scourgeth any son whom he receiveth. If he endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the, fa whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. This idea that, well, God must be pleased with me because he's not punishing me. No, he might not be punishing me because you're not one of his children. No. Look, I might notice other children misbehaving, but it's not my place to go discipline them. <laughs> but if my own children are acting out, that's a different story. And, if, and spiritually speaking, if you are able to live your life however you want without ever getting a spiritual spanking from the Lord, it's not because he's pleased with you, it's because you're not one of his kids. Whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, period. Amen. Not sometimes, not every now and then. Whom the Lord loves, who, those who belong to him, he corrects. And if your testimony is going to be a stepping stone, bringing other people closer to the Lord, it starts first with reform and change in your own life. Being saved. Having your heart changed, having your mind renewed, having your thoughts and your motivations converted. Verse 3 says that unless ye be converted, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you this. If you're not going to heaven yourself, how are you supposed to lead anybody else there? Yeah. If I'm dri driving around lost and wandering around aimlessly, I'm in no position to help anybody else get to their destination. But once you get converted, everything changes. John chapter 5, verse 24 says, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. God says when you believe on him, when you get saved, a conversion takes place. You, your heart changes, you pass from death to life. If we want to have the type of testimony that draws people closer to God, it starts first with conversion from death to life. The conversion, the reform that only God's amazing grace can accomplish in our lives. Now we sing that song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Yep. Amen. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. Not anymore. Yep. I've been converted. I, I, I've been reformed. There's a noticeable change in my life that is evident since I've gotten saved. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I was in darkness, but God saved me. I was blind, but God changed that. He opened my eyes. He opened my mind when I opened my heart and accepted him as my Savior. So the first point that we see that shows how to have a testimony that leads other people to Christ is first we need to be reformed. And next we see reduce. And verse 4 it says, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, if you want to be great, if you want to live a life that's really a stepping stone for others to draw closer to God, humble yourself. The word humble comes from the Latin word humulus, which means lowly or literally on the ground. It's derived from the word humus, which means earth. So what we see here is the idea of someone so meek, so self-effacing, so much so that they're willing to humble themselves to the point of getting on the lowest position possible, which is lying, lying alongside the, the ground. And this is something that does not come naturally to individuals, yeah. even as Christians. No. We want to be the best. We want to be noticed. We want the attention. But God says here, if you want to be great in God's eyes, humble yourself. Mm. If you want other people to think you're great, talk about yourself. Self-promote. Draw attention to yourself. Mm. But if you want God to be pleased with you, humble yourself. Amen. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Yeah. James 4.10, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Matthew 23, verse 12, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that humble himself shall be exalted. I want you to think for a minute about the people who've had the most influence on your life spiritually. The people who've had the biggest impact on your spiritual life. I'm going to guess that they were humble people. 
you might say, well, well, how do you know that? Because God says that the humble people are the ones that he would use to be the greatest. The people that humble themselves are the ones that God exalts. They're the ones that he allows to reach other people for him and have an impact on their lives. If you want to be a stepping stone that leads other people to a closer walk with the Lord, be a humble person. Nobody likes to be around a bragger. Even if they're saved, no one wants to be around someone who's full of themselves and pretentious. If you want to be used by the Lord, be humble. And Matthew chapter 5, verse 5 says, The meek shall inherit the earth. Not the proud and the boastful, but the meek, the lowly, the humble. That, those are the ones that are going to inherit the earth. And once again, back in verse 4, it says, Whosoever therefore, therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now it's been said that the tree that has the most fruit is the one that bends to the ground. Sri Chandroy said, A tree, when it has no fruit to offer, remains erect. But when the tree is laden with fruit, mm. it bends down. Yes. Lots of Christians, unfortunately, are proud. They like to talk about themselves. Mm. Act like they're better than other people. Mm. They like to stand up kind of tall and puff out their chest. But they're not bearing any spiritual fruit. Because nobody really wants to follow their example. But humble people are more fruitful and they're more fruitful because they're humble. Next time you, you see a, a tree, say an orange tree, it might look tall and impressive, but only when it's not holding any fruit. But you see those orange trees that are bending over closer to the ground, and, you, and you'll notice that they're producing much more fruit. And if we want to produce much more fruit in our lives, spiritually speaking, we need to be humble ourselves. John said it very simply in, in chapter 3, verse 30, He must increase, and I must decrease. If we want to live our lives as a testimony that leads other people to Christ, we must be willing to reduce or humble ourselves. So we see from our text, we see reform, we see reduce, and next we see receive. Verse 5 says, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. If we want to guide our children, our friends, or our family members to a closer walk with the Lord, we have to, it says here, we have to receive them and you might be thinking well of course you know that should go without saying that that we as followers of christ should be open and accepting of anyone that wants to get closer to god that's not always the case if you look over at the next chapter matthew chapter 19 and verse 13 it says then there were brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray and the disciples rebuked them and jesus said suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. That, that word there, disciple, in verse 13 means a follower. So there were children who were bought, brought to Jesus so that he would bless them and pray for them, put his hands on them, yeah. and the disciples, the, fo the followers of Jesus, the quote-unquote spiritual people, rebuked them and said, no, don't do that. Hmm. They tried to stop them from coming and tried to limit their access to Jesus. And what does our text say here in verse 6? Don't offend them. Jesus says, don't repel them, don't rebuke them, don't reject them. He says in verse 5, receive them. No. There might be people in your, in your life that you don't know their motivation. You might not know if they're serious when they ask you spiritual questions. You might not know if they're genuine or if they're sincere. But God says here in verse 5, don't reject them, receive them. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 says, a soft anger turns away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. If you're more concerned with winning an argument with someone than seeing them draw closer to the Lord, you're not going to be much of a testimony for the Lord. If you're more cynical about people than you are sensitive to them, you're not going to be a powerful testimony for the Lord. If you have a tendency to point out other people's flaws more than speaking to them about your own faith, you're not going to have much of a spiritual impact for the Lord. And if you have more of a natural tendency here, as we see like the disciples did, to reject or rebuke people than actually inviting them in and receiving them, you're not going to be a stepping stone to them being right. drawn closer to the Lord. Right. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying that you should avoid discussing sin or accept things that are clearly wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But if you think you're just going to beat people over the head with the Bible and that somehow they're going to sense the love of Christ while you're constantly berating them and putting them down, then you're wrong. Right. We need to remember sometimes that that God loved us while we were sinners. Yep. And we're still sinners, and he still loves us. You know, he didn't wait for us to get our lives together before he decided that he would save us. 
know, he didn't say, you know, go get your life cleaned up and come back and we'll talk about this, this whole thing about eternal life. No, you got saved and then God started making changes in your life. Yes. We have to receive people and accept them with, with all their flaws, all their imperfections, all the things that we don't know or that we don't like about them. If we're going to be a stepping stone to them being drawn closer to the Lord. You know, as Christians, we should still be able to hate sin and still love sinners. Yeah, that's right. We should be able to love people enough to receive them and demonstrate the love and compassion of a God who that indicates a presence in our of His love in our own lives. And as Christians, if we reject people, how can we ever expect them to receive Christ? If you have a family member who you don't see eye to eye with, or if you have a, a co-worker who rubs you the wrong way, if you have a neighbor who you look at and just think, man, I just wish I didn't have to deal with them anymore. Just, just remember, God didn't have to deal with your sin. He didn't have to look past my sin and my shame. He didn't have to forgive me. He didn't have to receive me, but he did. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If we want to live lives that result in other people believing on his name, becoming sons and daughters of God, we have to accept people and receive them the same way God did us. Amen. We looked at the warning here against being a stumbling block, and we see here three keys to being a stepping stone, reform, reduce, and then receive. But the, title, the complete title of today's message is, is your, is your testimony a stumbling block or a stepping stone, and how to change it? Because you might be thinking, well, I've been saved, but to be honest, there are some things in my life or some things in my past that might be a stumbling block to other people. There are things that I've done in the past, and that's not me anymore. I'm not the same person. I'm saved. I'm different. I've been changed. But other people just don't seem to really accept that, I, that I'm any different. How can I change my testimony from being a stumbling block to a stepping stone? And the first thing that I would say is patience. You know, there's an old saying, time heals all wounds. There are some things that, frankly... It might take people some time to accept and understand that you have truly and genuinely changed. If you remember back in the book of Acts, in chapter 9, it talks about when Paul became a follower of the Lord on the road to Damascus. And later on in the chapter, uh, Paul speaks to a man named Ananias and told him to go to Paul. Yeah. And Ananias said, his, we have his words recorded, and says, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on their name. And, and Ananias says, Lord, I don't know about this guy. You know, this, is, this is a bad dude. He, he's done some things that I, I don't know if I feel comfortable. I don't know if we should trust him. He's messed up. I don't know if we should go over there. But then in verse 15, God says, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. See, it's easy to say you've gotten saved and that you've changed. But some people aren't going to believe you right away. Mm. Especially people that you've hurt or people that you've wronged in the past. Mm. They might be skeptical that you've actually uh, converted in your life. So the first thing we see is we just need patience. That for them to see that it's not an act. That God has actually worked in your life. It might just take them some time to actually understand that and to see that. Everybody likes to quote, you know, don't judge anybody else. But John chapter 7, verse 24 says, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. If you've done things in the past that make people question the sincerity of your salvation, then there's going to have to be some proof also that shows that you've actually changed. Yeah. Uh, we already mentioned earlier, reform. There, there should be a clear indication that you're a different person now as a saved person than you were before you got saved. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9, it says, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. When you get saved, there are some things that should accompany your salvation. There should be some proof, there should be some indication of a truly repentant heart and a truly changed life when we get saved. In, John, in 1 John three eighteen, it says, Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. If you're truly a different person, if you've truly changed the person, that will come out in your actions and the way you live your life, not just in the words that you say. Amen. But with patience and with proof, your testimony can be changed from being a stumbling block to a stepping stone. 
We saw here from our text today that if we want to live our lives to be stepping stones that people can follow and be drawn closer to the Lord, we have to change, we have to convert, we have to reform. We must be saved and then show evidence that God has really done a work in our own lives. We must also reduce. We must be willing to humble ourselves in order to magnify Christ in other people's lives. And we have to accept other people and receive them where they are and lead them if we want them to be drawn closer to the Lord. If I could have Miss Janet and Brother Bud come forward this time, we'll prepare now for a time of invitation. If I could have every head bowed and every eye closed. And if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, we'd like to give you the opportunity to do that right now. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We all fall short every single day of our lives. We sin. We say things we shouldn't say. We do things we shouldn't do. And that sin separates us from a holy and perfect God. But the good news is that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for all of our sins. Amen. And by, by believing on his name, we can have forgiveness of our sins here on earth and eternal life with him in heaven. If you've never been saved, I'd like to encourage you to do that now. And There's no special prayer that you must pray to get saved. But right from where you're seated, I'm going to lead in a word of prayer. And if you'd like to pray quietly in your mind and silently in your heart, Dear God, I realize I'm a sinner and I can never reach heaven on my own. I can never do enough good deeds or be a good enough person to earn heaven by myself. Lord, right now I place my faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son who died for my sins and rose from the dead to forgive me of my sins. Please forgive me of my sins and help me to live for you. Thank you for accepting me and giving me eternal life. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you keep your heads bowed and keep your eyes closed, if you accepted Jesus Christ for your Savior today, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, um, if you could slip your hand up really quickly. If you're here today and you're saved, and you want your life to be more of a stepping stone, you want to be a person that people can come to and be drawn closer to the Lord, if that's your prayer today, if it's your prayer today, if you'd raise your hand so we can pray for you about that. And I would see those hands. Amen. You can take them down after you raise them. If you're saying you've already been saved, you've already been reformed, but maybe there's an issue in your life where you need to humble yourselves. Maybe you need to submit yourself more to God's will so that people will see a true, genuinely changed spirit of the Lord in your life. If you'd like prayer today to help humble yourself, you lift your hand, we'll pray for you about that. Amen. We see those hands. Amen. Yes, you can take them down after you raise them. If your prayer today is to have a more sensitive heart, to be more open and welcoming, to receive people who, frankly, sometimes might rub us the wrong way. There's something that you need prayer about to be more loving and receiving other people the way that Christ accepted us. And that's your prayer today. If you'd raise your hand. And then we see those hands. Yes, amen. You can take them down if you raise them. Amen. This time I'd invite you to stand as we have a word of prayer as we prepare now for the time of invitation. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just thank you for those that are here today. Yes. Lord, we just thank you for the, the working of the Holy Spirit. Yes. We thank you for those that are sensitive to that moving. Lord, I pray for the people here, Father. Every here gives a, a profession, Father, of at least accepting you as their Savior. And we're thankful for that. Lord, we don't want to just be saved. Lord, we want to be living our lives in such a way to draw other people closer to you. Lord, I pray for those that have asked for prayer to humble themselves. Father, that you'll help us to, um, as, as, as Paul said, like we have to die daily. Lord, we have, there's some things we have to crucify in our own lives. We have to give of our own wants and our own wishes sometimes if we're going to lead other people to you. Father, I pray that you'll help us be willing to humble ourselves, to um, reduce ourselves in order to reach other people. Father, I pray that you'll also help us to receive people with open arms. Father, I pray for you'll bring in more people, Father, that are searching you. People that, people that need to be saved, people who want a closer walk with the Lord. And Father, I pray that when you bring those people into our lives, when you bring them into our church, 
Help us to be the individuals and Christians that are the first ones to greet them and help them to feel welcome, yeah. to receive them and to guide them in, in their spiritual walk to get yeah. closer to you. Father, as we have a time now of, um, of invitation, I pray that you'll continue to work in the hearts and lives of everybody here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.